Welcome to Organizing Biodiversity. This is our first unit for Biology 4DS. I uh, hope you're excited as I am. And let's get into this. So this unit is about defining the concept of biodiversity in terms of ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity, explaining why it's difficult to define a species, why dynamic natures are classified, why classification is dynamic and it's changing over time, and uh, some other ideas like that. Uh, it is also about uh, describing different types of evidence that we use in classifying organized organisms and determining their, their evolutionary relationships. So what can we look at? And then we're also going to be comparing some prokaryotic, eukaryotic life from their cell structures. And uh, we'll also look at some of the, the uh, kingdoms of, of life, and then also compare some phyla to understand how they're related to each other. So the very first question, the big question we're going to cover today, and today only, is going to be a very short, quick video, is what is life? So what does it mean for something to be alive? And so when we think about life, what we want to think about is how organisms are organized. So organisms could show a hierarchical levels of organization, so hierarchy here, this means uh, level. So, uh, you know, when we have a king and all of, and some princes, and then we have dukes and, um, you know, soldiers, and then we have citizens and commoners. So a hierarchy, there are levels. So similarly, there are levels when you think about an, an organism. You've got the whole world Right? the whole world and all of the living things in the world. And so that would be called the biosphere. So this is the world. You just believe. So this is the world. World's life. And then you can go smaller and then you have ecosystems. So we're looking at certain areas of the world where there's like a bunch of organisms that are all similar in some way. Then we have communities where we're looking at like a group that interacts specifically with each other. So, you know, in, in uh, I don't know, in the prairie ecosystem or in, the, in Manitoba as an ecosystem, there are communities within that ecosystem that directly impact each other. Uh, an ant mound over here is not really interacting with an ant mound that's a couple miles away. Those, those ants aren't really related to each other. So the community would be smaller community would be that sort of grouping of uh, ants and then the birds that are eating those ants and then the uh, the foxes that are eating those birds so it's sort of an interactive community and then you have the population and the population we're probably uh, looking at sort of one group of organisms so maybe that whole ant hill that would be the population we'd be talking about and then the organism that we're talking about is the single organism pulling out one ant and looking at it saying like hey this is an ant and then, you know, all the parts of that ant and how they're related. And then we pull that ant apart and we look inside of it and we say, hey, there's some organs in these plants. So there's some organization in the way the organs are uh, or the organ system. Then we have organs inside of the organ system. And then we have tissues that make up those organs. And then we have cells that make up those tissues. And then we have molecules that make up the cells. And then the molecules are made up of atoms. So each time there's sort of a place for... Uh, biologists to study, biologists to, uh, you know, look for new information and to interact with it. So that's how organization plays into biology. And then organisms acquire material and energy. So any organism that's alive, that for, in order for it to qualify as being alive, it needs to acquire materials and energy. So it has to go out and get it. How does it do that? Well, I mean, plants, they do that by absorbing sunlight. They acquire the sunlight energy and they acquire some, mat some matter from the, from the water supply, from the soil, and they combine those together. Uh, but there's also you and me, we'll go out and we grow, we buy a, buy a hamburger and we you know, enjoy it. And that's our material, that's our matter that we're putting into our bodies, our energy. Organisms reproduce. Sometimes this is easier to think about than others. Um, you know, it's easy to understand that human beings reproduce by the formation of children uh, from couplings, I guess. 
Uh, but we also have things like sponges that reproduce and sponges can reproduce in a lot of different ways. A sponge can be broken in half and then you get two sponges. Um, but sponges can also have sex cells that actually interact and they form a new uh, combination of genetics to make a new organism. Uh, And so then, and then those genes that they that make them up. Though, so we are going to talk a lot about genes. These are the the characteristics, the the uh, the information carried in the cells that cause the organism to appear the way they appear. And that that those genes get passed from generation to generation. It's going to be a whole unit. We're going to talk about that and how that works. Organisms respond to stimuli. So organized organisms will respond to external stimuli by either moving away or towards a stimulus. So in this way, we can have an organism that, you know, we can think about organisms have to be, have to respond somehow. Uh, even a plant will have a, will turn to, uh, towards or away from the light. Um, a jellyfish, a nadarian will, uh, it, it, if you poke it, it will contract. Um, or the cells that make that along the the tentacles of a jellyfish, they actually will like, will fire out little needles. Uh, that's how a man, how a man of war will stab you and cause you to have a anaphylactic reaction, and then it can't really eat you, but it will cause it cause you to not have a good time. Organisms are homeostatic. So if you took a grade eleven biology. You would have mentioned a lot about homeostasis, but homeostatic is the idea that uh, organisms try to stay at a constant state. So uh, your human body cells, they stay at a specific temperature. And we actually try, our bodies try to bring in a certain amount of water and push out a certain amount of water to keep the amount of fresh water in the body at a constant level. And this is what most organisms do. Some have more complicated roots for this. Uh, there are Organisms that can fall asleep for long periods of time, like bacteria that can go dormant and dry, almost dry out, and then, but then they will return back to a hydrated state at a later date. Uh, you know, they can even hide inside your own cells and then activate later when you're sick, like um, like uh, cold sores. Right? So cold sores, they will is a is a type of uh, organism that's living in your cells, and it will activate and deactivate. Uh, at different times in your, uh, throughout your, uh, when your bodies are sick or not, are not sick. Organisms also grow and develop, so they increase in size or increase in the number of cells. Even single-celled organisms are alive, so, but those single-celled organisms still undergo a, a phase where they are one size, they grow, and then they split into two, and then they're small again, and then they grow, and then they split into two, and then they're small again, and then they grow and split into two. So they, they are going undergoing, even if they're only one cell, they still are undergoing a change. Uh, in humans, we start with as fertilized eggs, and we grow into embryos and fetuses. So we see that obviously that, that is a much larger change, a much more obvious one. And then the last one, which is the interesting one, is that organisms have the capacity to adapt. And this is one that's coming straight out of evolutionary biology. So as environments change, as species change uh, to be better adapted to new environments, uh, or as environments change, species will change. And that's one of the major tenets of evolutionary biology is that if you have a large enough population, within that population, there are individuals that are going to succeed even with change. And so then those that succeed with change um, are going to influence the next generation, and the next generation, next generation. So over long periods of time, it appears that species can adapt and change to uh, to some of those changes, provided the changes are slow and not disastrous. Natural selection is also a process that is unique to living creatures. Natural selection is a process that selects for the best adapted individuals within an environment to have the opportunity to reproduce and pass on their genes. So that's that's a unique process that only living creatures really undergo in exactly that's this way. All right, so we have three practice questions. These are very typical of the types of questions I would ask on an assignment, which will probably be coming by the end of the week. You'll have your first assignment. Um, 
And so, you know, I want you to sit back and consider these. It's a good time to pause the video. If you're watching this on our Google Classroom, you can pause that right now. And then um, I will quickly go through. I don't like to make my videos too, too long. So I'm gonna try to do this in five minutes or less. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm talking a lot so that you can pause it. I'm hoping you're pausing it. So ready, set, let's say, I'm gonna put a big pause here. Pause. Okay, you did it, you paused, you answered it. It's not, it doesn't work if you didn't answer it. Sure? You can pause it, you can pause it anytime. Okay, all right. I won't give you so much of a hassle every time that we ask, answer these questions, but it is always, uh, you're always gonna learn more if you make a mistake first. So in learning theory, you uh, learn more from mistakes more from struggle. Struggle is a very key concept in learning. Uh, learning theorists, the theorists have shown that you learn a lot more if you have to struggle. So I really recommend that you do a little bit of struggle. These questions are hard to answer for you, then you need to try to do them. because that, that, That's when you know that you're learning something. So let's consider a tree. So I give some examples of how it uh, satisfies each of the characters. Select. Let's just kind of go back. We'll just do it to get uh, in here. So is it organized? Yeah, for sure. It has, uh, you know, trees have cells and organs. Uh, they come in different species or different uh, groups, different populations, different species, etc. So, yeah, for sure, trees. Trees even are found in different. Uh, Trees have have uh, have cells. Wow, I really did not write that very well. Cells, organs, uh, and different species, species, ecosystems, etc. So they definitely cover all of these factors that we were thinking about here. Maybe I can do something like this. Uh, so they acquire energy? Yes. Uh, so here's our example, our trees. Trees uh, use CO2 and sunlight for creating cells and energy. Uh, do they reproduce? Yeah, tree, trees, uh, you know, trees produce uh, pollen and seeds and fruit uh, to reproduce. Will they respond to stimuli? Yeah, so some, some uh, yeah, trees uh, will slow down in the uh, winter months. They are more active in spring and summer. So, you know, pollen season or, or allergy season, the reason it's allergy season is because the plants are producing more pollen. So they are responding to the environment. Uh, are they homeostatic? Yeah, they, uh, yeah, so trees uh, keep a constant uh, water and mineral level in their cells or get sick and die. So a tree will actually get sick, right? Uh, the organism grow, yes. Uh, trees, of course, grow from grow from from small seeds, and they have the chance to adapt. And yeah, that was so. That this would be an example, like uh, like so. Conifers uh, are adapted for colder environments. Well, deciduous, deciduous trees, so leafed trees. I can't spell deciduous, but that's okay. Uh, let's call it leafy trees. Leaf bearing trees are, uh, are better in warmer environments. But if you really wanted, you could talk about, oh boy, 
you could even talk about how um, you know in Manitoba our deciduous tree our deciduous trees ours our trees with and by by prominence uh, in in Manitoba, our leafed trees will actually lose their leaves in the winter. So that's like a that's an adaptation. Whereas like trees in the tropics don't have to lose their leaves, uh, even if they're related trees. Uh, so bacteria. So we could do the same thing with bacteria. So I think we can go through a lot of examples here. The hardest ones are maybe to acquire materials. So bacteria will feed off of. Well, you know what? Better do it over here. Okay. So uh, there was my 15 minute timer. So, okay, so bacteria are, bacteria are organized into species and cell types, cell types, etc. cetera. They, uh, they may, may be parasitic, gaining food from a host like a bacteria that lives in your cells, they reproduce, yeah, they reproduce by division, by asexual uh, division. Uh, they can also actually undergo a really cool process called, um, called uh, horizontal gene transfer, and that's where two bacteria will actually touch the touch ends, and then they will exchange information. So if one has gained a new trait, it can actually give it to another cell. It would be like if you uh, you shook hands with someone and they got your blue eyes just by shaking hands. Uh, so it's really unique to bacteria, but it is it is sort of a part of reproduction. Do they reproduce? They do they respond to stimuli? Yes, uh, yeah. So bacteria bacteria can uh, go dormant in uh, in cells of a healthy individual and reactivate when they are sick. So that's like, if they're living in your cells, they can wait around as little sort of hidden uh, hidden enemies. They're also good cells, of course. Um, are they homeostatic? Yeah, so uh, one of the ways that you can kill bacteria is to dry them out. So bacteria need to maintain maintain a certain uh, level of hydration to survive. Do they grow and develop? Yeah, they grow, grow till they can divide. So you have to reach a certain size before division is even possible. And so that they do grow. And do they adapt uh, the presence of uh, so um, drug resistant bacteria prove they are capable of evolving under stress. So we will talk, I'm sure, lots and lots about drug resistant bacteria in this course, but drug resistant bacteria are a type of bacteria that have developed the resistance to the normal antibacterial medicines that we apply. And that's directly because they are adapting to their environment. We've made the uh, we've artificially made the environment dangerous, and now those bacteria are adapted to it. Now, COVID nineteen is a virus. Which qualities does it lack? So that's an interesting one. If you are not sure about this one, you can actually flip all the way to the last page of the booklet. I believe it's nearly the last page of the booklet. And I even gave you a little write-up on viruses. So viruses are a form of non-life. Um, they're typically a nucleic acid, so either DNA or, or RNA, and they're surrounded by sort of a protein shell. They're not cells, they don't contain cells, um, and they're not considered living, so we don't put them in the bio biochemical classification system. It is a non-living strand of genetic material within a protein coat has no organelles and it does not use energy. So there's your more, there's one of your key points. It cannot make proteins and it cannot move and it cannot replicate on its own. So it can't even really react to the environment on its own. Some are not harmful, others are infectious and dangerous. Um, and so where do viruses come from? Their origins are not known of course, but they're not known exactly, but there are some theories about which where they could be. Uh, some 
theories are that they are uh, pieces of DNA and RNA that developed in living organisms that became sort of um, self, not self-aware, but able to survive outside of the body. Uh, this is the general structure, is a capsid, which is a shell around a DNA uh, molecule on the inside. Uh, coronavirus does have a different shell type. This is a specific type of virus that has these little uh, sort of spider looking things. Uh, coronavirus has more of this style where there's a shell of protein with, uh, surrounding a, uh, a virus on the inside or viral DNA on the inside. And typically to, to infect, what a virus does is it will it'll sneak inside of the, sh of the host and then use the host's own proteins and mechanisms inside to cause the host cell to make new copies. So that's where it's really, really different from what we would think of as a living organism. It really can't accomplish much without the assistance of another organism. So it cannot independently reproduce. It cannot independently uh, uh, re, uh, adapt. So let's put that, those in here as well. So it uh, does not need energy to survive, to live, because it's not alive. Cannot reproduce independently. Needs a host cell. Uh, and it cannot uh, cannot even adapt. It cannot adapt independently. They do adapt, but they can't do it independently. They need that extra cell. That they need that cell to provide the resources for it. Use a cell, and even then, it um, it can be a case of sort of. Uh, those that survive with the virus are the ones that are going to pass it on or which it depends on which host is passing the virus on as to which version of the virus gets spread. Uh, I think that covers all of the basics here. Uh, if we were to it, be able to put those questions to paper um, uh, with these types of answers, and that's what I would be looking for. So I always do want to see, you know, a full idea. Try to use sentences wherever you can in your answers and try to complete the question. Always consider what did I ask in the question. Sometimes I'll even give you advice, like one or two sentences to answer this question. And uh, my expectation is you follow that advice. All right, thanks everybody. Have yourselves a great day. And we will talk to you in the next video uh, where we will be talking about biodiversity as a concept. All right, have a good one.